Well, welcome. Happy New Year. This panel is about rewriting the rule book with generative AI. Just a year ago, OpenAI reached 100 million users around this time in January, just two months after its launch. Since then, every company has tried to figure out what does generative AI mean for them. In fact, Accenture, our research finds that 98% of senior executives believe that generative AI is going to disrupt their three to five year strategies. It'd be interesting to know what those 2% are thinking. But that's not the panel that we have here. So just a year later, we have an amazing panel of industry leaders who are going to share how they've been using generative AI to uh, reinvent consumer relationships and brand experiences. And in the next hour, we're going to be walking through five must-do imperatives needed to rewrite the rule book and lead in the age of generative AI. My name is Teresa Tung. I'm Accenture Cloud First Chief Technologist, and I'll be your moderator. And so let's just get started. So the first must-do imperative is around leading with value. We did. If 2023 was around experimentation, uh, 2024 is about scale. And to do that, we need to start by defining the value. And so a lot of times when we think about generative AI, we start with things like improving productivity. But there's even more value when you look at the end-to-end -end value chain and you look at reinventing activities that create, um, accelerate new innovation and create new growth. So with that first imperative, I'm going to kick it off with the panelists. Um, let me introduce first and thank Joff Baker. Uh, Director of Information Technology at BMW. Thank you, Joff, for being here. Mm -hmm. And so, Joff, how does this uh, first imperative, uh, leading with value, resonate with you and the need to, uh, at BMW to use generative AI to improve efficiencies and create value? Sure. Um, so first of all, um, what we looked at is how can we start to drive the efficiencies across a number of our different um, service desks, as well as supporting our application engineers in not only understanding the data, but also access to the data, but taking the data and making knowledge from that data. So we pulled the data together, um, placed that into our general AI ecosystem, um, and then started to use that data for knowledge for subject matter experts. So we could actually just use a, um, a very simple interface to ask questions to help them resolve complex questions, complex queries, um, Firstly, from an IT perspective um, on the service desk, then moving to our application teams, but then also expanding that into our business subject matter experts. Um, some of the efficiencies that we've seen are reducing um, complex queries and complex issues from six hours down to 43 minutes um, by driving um, those type of queries in that ecosystem. Um, so this has really driven a lot of efficiency across um, all of our areas from a service perspective for internal customers. And now we're expanding that out to our, our dealer customers as well, where they can actually leverage such efficiencies as well at the same time. So fantastic results there. And what we're seeing is, is that the data that we've collected into, that, into the Gen AI ecosystem is helping share the knowledge um, across all of our subject matter experts um, across BMW which is great, business and IT, so excellent. Thank you, Jeff. So this use case about knowledge management, every company has this use case. And to go from a productivity increase from six hours to 43 minutes, um, I can never find anything on my laptop, much less across the company. So that, that is amazing. And then leading into beyond service desk and into uh, future growth, I think that, that's a great example leading with value. I'm going to continue on, and, and thank you, Jeff Voris. Uh, Jeff Voris, uh, Senior VP of Global Innovation and Experience Design from Marriott. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thanks. Is this on? Uh, I hope it's going to come on soon, because I'm going to ask okay. a question. Uh, Jeff, can you share what you're doing at Marriott to uh, use generative AI to create new possibilities for your guests and your associates? What we do is delivered by people. That is the core of our business, absolutely. And so it's really about saying, how do we use these technologies to improve that? How do we use it to improve customer experience? Uh, how do we use it to improve associate experience, to generate content, and to improve operations? So when we began this journey, we created uh, an internal incubator 
and solicited use cases around the company. We gathered about 200 use cases, and they fell into those buckets, into how do we improve, uh, how do we improve uh, guest and associate uh, experience, how do we improve efficiency, and how do we generate content better. So for each of those, as we dove in, we found ways to say, there, all these things that are delivered by humans, we can find ways to make them more um, focused on the interaction between the guest and the associate rather than on the technology. Often that's uh, a challenge in the past. Uh, for content generation, when we look at things like marketing, it offers us the opportunity to be able to get much more targeted, much more specific, and deliver a much better result. And then operational efficiency, we live in a place where we have many systems integrated uh, across the enterprise delivering all sorts of um, guest interface. And how do we find ways to improve that process, whether it's uh, scheduling or uh, operational efficiency? Thank you, Jeff. So the way that you looked across the value chain is really powerful, right? You're looking at for the opportunities and the ROI across those dimensions. Um, I want to now welcome John Halverson, uh, Global Senior VP, Consumer Services at Mondelez. Thank you for being here as well. Thank you for having me. And it works. Uh -huh. uh, that was a test, right? Um, so John, how are you using generative AI at Mondelez to reinvent the consumer experience? And can you share some of the benefits that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think, like a lot of people, you initially get attracted to the cost. It's like, how am I going to do non-working? Inspired by a lot of work that your company has done in that space in terms of automate the bottom funnel, produce e-commerce pages, I think. Then you see speed. And you can be, I admire a lot of what Coke has done in point of sale. Mm -hmm. I think where we get really excited and see the multiplier effect is in effectiveness. I think that the best experiences, and truly at the core of our company, we're a marketing company that creates experiences for consumers and our brands, come when we're able to get to a level of personalization and really show that we understand them, not as from a demographic, but from a true empathy pattern. And so we see generative AI as a way to deliver that personalization at true scale. And for us, I mean, the order of magnitude is, if you could save 10% of your non-working or 20% of your non-working, the impact on effectiveness is 10x that. Mm. And so for us, we see this as that big driver, the numerator, to how do we finally reach those upper echelons of effectiveness that's gonna massively change the P&L. 20 million in cost, kind of exciting. 200 million of incremental revenue every year, that's game changing for the organization. That's putting one of our top 15, another top 15 brand into the company every single year. And that's what gets us excited. Uh, that's true value right there. And, and last but not least, thank you, Ismita, Ismita for running over from uh, the L'Oreal keynote. Ismita yes. Dubay's our Chief Digital and Marketing Officer at L'Oreal. Ismita, L'Oreal is repositioning itself as a beauty tech company. How does generative AI play in um, enabling that goal? And in particular, you had a great example about how generative AI is extending your research into ingredients. Can you share? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, so indeed, we are pioneering beauty tech. And when we say beauty tech, it means a new kind of relationship with our consumer. One that is based and that is creating value based on technology, data, and AI. And in terms of using generative AI, what we are doing is we are democratizing beauty services. Just today, 10 minutes ago, you know, at the keynote of CES, our brand L'Oreal Paris, it launched a service. And the service is called uh, Beauty Genius. Yeah? So if you look at Beauty Genius, Beauty Genius is powered by generative AI. Yeah? And it is almost like a personal beauty advisor in our consumer's pocket 24-7. Now, why do we need that? Because 70% of beauty consumers, they feel overwhelmed by the number <coughs> of choices that they have in front of them. So as a result, what consumers do is uh, they, they don't know which products to buy. They ask their friends. Uh, they search online. They watch a video. Uh, at the same time, they're looking for, like, somebody tell me which are the best products today. Thanks to Beauty Tech, what Beauty Genius has done is Beauty Genius brings product curation, a suite of services, and consumer care all in one. And it uses multiple technologies. It uses generative AI, but it uses augmented reality. It uses computer vision. It uses color science. And it meets a real consumer need. And I'll take a minute to explain that, because the three points which I said, how product creation, yeah? When we say product creation by this service, 
actually what we are doing is we are bringing personalized education. We are curating all the education from social media and our brand websites, and then it can come directly to the consumer in their pocket. It also means personalized recommendation because the brand L'Oreal Paris has thousands of SKUs. Here we have about 750 SKUs, uh, which are uh, you know, products on skin care, hair care, uh, color, which are brought together and we make a recommendation on that. When we talk about a suite of services, uh, these are many different beauty services that we have been preparing with Beauty Tech, thanks to Beauty Tech. But one of them, for example, personalized diagnosis. We can do a diagnostic of each and every individual uh, on their hair, on their skin, and therefore our motto is beauty for each, powered by Beauty Tech. Uh, the third thing I spoke about was consumer care. So when we are talking about consumer care, it is about answering consumers' question. It becomes a personalized Q&A. And a personalized Q&A can be very interesting because you can ask uh, sensitive questions on uh, acne, on dandruff, on hair loss. And indeed, some consumers may be uncomfortable asking those questions you know, one to one in an in, a in store or an environment with somebody else. So all in all, this is how we are creating value. And uh, like I said, uh, our motto is beauty for each, powered by beauty tech. Thank you. So great examples across the board about leading with value. Could be productivity, but hopefully you're seeing by looking across the value chain and reinventing ways of working, we're getting exponential uh, orders of magnitude yeah. opportunity. So that brings us to the second imperative. So the second imperative is around um, creating and establishing a strong digital core. So this is that technical foundation that AI powers your data and your AI applications needed so that you bring your context about your products, your people, and your processes. And to, to bring that to life, uh, now let's welcome Accenture's own uh, Oliver Wright. He's our global consumer goods and services lead. And so Oliver, can you describe how, how does that strong digital core create better consumer experiences? Yeah, Teresa, thanks so much. And can, you, can you guys, yes, perfect, okay. Um, so just to be, to be clear, the wonderful examples we've described here are not possible without enabling technology and data. And what we found when we've been doing uh, exercises across the industry as a whole, and I think as most of you know, we work with the vast majority of players across the industry, is that um, when we've described the idea that companies like L'Oreal are increasingly driven by, uh, by, by technology, um, the industry as a whole is not well prepared for this as a whole. So if we look at the simple question of, asking executives, where does thinking about data and technology fit into the corporate strategy process? You'd expect in this day and age that if, it's, if digital really is at the core, that it would be really very central to actually shaping the strategy of the organization itself. And what we find is that still today, it is a trailing attribute. That your people, most companies in the industry are still today uh, creating what their corporate strategy is, and then saying, how can data and technology inform that? So the first part of this is not, a, not the technology platform itself, but it is the mindset that recognizes that to be relevant in the future, executives, leadership teams as a whole, have got to be comfortable with where technology is going, where, te where data is going, and that they use that to actually say, OK, this is where we as an organization, what our ambition should actually be. And there remains a significant gap in the industry today in terms, of, in, in terms of that awareness of it being really at the core of the organization. So that's the kind of strategic part of this. The second thing I would just call out is the role of data, because none of the, again, none of the things that we've described here are going to be possible without having the right sort of structured data, which has been the, the norm in the industry, increasingly unstructured data. And now we're finding lots and lots of examples of where, where um, syndicated data can actually also, uh, since, sorry, synthetic, synthetic data can also be relevant. The challenge we've got right now, again, is that there is a huge level of remediation that's going to be required to create the data that's going to be needed. So we literally, have, over the last few weeks, we just leading into the Christmas holidays, we reached out to look at about 30 of the very largest consumer goods companies in the world, and we asked executives this question about the degree to which they think they've got the right sort of data in place. 80% of them are saying to us that they don't. And so we're expecting that to create the sort of capabilities that are required across the industry as a whole, there is going to need to be a lot of very basic data remediation that's going to be required to make what we know is going to be possible a reality. 
Great points. And you mentioned it's not just a technology enabler. It's completely strategic, right? To be able to enable any of these use cases, we need that data. It's your first party data that is going to be the differentiator uh, that you bring to bear. So with our, that, let's talk through our third must-do imperative. It's reinventing talent and ways of working. So um, some of the hard part is getting you know, some of the people who know how to build and apply generative AI, but a lot of it is how does it change the ways of working with the talent that's there today? People are afraid of AI taking jobs. It's not AI taking jobs. It's somebody who's now empowered with AI, who knows how to use AI, and those are going to be the leaders um, in the future. So with, with that in mind, uh, let's start this time with John. So John, um, and Mona Lisa has done, um, what has Mona Lisa done as part of introducing generative AI to uh, make it appealing and exciting for people? And can you give an example of how you've been able to improve daily tasks? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's two parts to this. I think the first thing that we did is we let people feel it and be real. I think when we talk about generative AI and we talk about these use cases and we talk about the speed to use and everything else, you can get into a very intangible world. And then people can't see it and they can't feel it. I think internally, one of the things we've done well is through a lot of our creative agencies, we've done really brilliant AI work. I point to Shadow Connor Ad, which won Can Lion, and some Effies in terms of the great work. Uh, birth, Cadbury birthday song, a poster and a half. We have about 30 real AI-driven creative campaigns so we can point to and say, hey, this is best in class. Mm -hmm. And then I think the second thing is, is we've done some sprints to help make it tangible. We work to build a large language model, kind of ultimately a brand brain that ultimately we can query against and produce content on the fly. And it's just amazing the childlike joy uh, you can have from a president of Europe or someone else when you put that in their hands and go, what do you want to make? Right? Like, what are you going to really do? And they'd be like, well, I want a holiday toast. And you can literally, and you start having them just type. And I don't, I don't believe that it's about putting random things in people's hands or unfractured or we should go off and do workshops and get people toys. But it's like in a structured way of just getting comfortable with it. We're working with Accenture. We're running some big sprints to really get hands-on tech to really be, and not like 15 of these, but really like 10 of them. We're doing pilots where we're leading user of consumer demand gen with Google. So again, we get the hands-on learning so we can size that prize and so I can confidently walk into the CSPO's office and say, this is going to deliver X and here's my proof. Um, but there's a retooling and I think there's, if we're all being honest, anyone who's on the cutting edge will say this is, this is the first time I've ever walked into a year. I looked at the objectives that I have. I assess the capability of my talent and my team and I see a true delta. And I think I've seen that in, there's a delta in marketing, but there's even a delta in the COEs. There's deltas in partners, there's delta here, because it's a brand new space. And you, when you see that, and you face that reality, you, one of two things happens. Either you say, I'm not ready for that, or you get excited and you run towards it. And I think that you have to run towards it in a really big way. Mm -hmm. You will talk about data being the big enabler. I will tell you it is speed. Because I have built product, I have worked with algorithms in previous roles and in this context, and what I see is once someone gets ahead of you, you will not catch them ever in perpetuity because there will be compounding exponential value created every single day. And so I really think that it is the pursuit of that, that hockey stick, that causes us to run, to say we have to retool, we have to change what it is, and there's no better time than now as you kind of close last year's conversations and you recontract on this year, it's literally, I'm telling my teams, 20% of your time this year is on new IP and personal capability. And that's, that's a big, that's clearing a day. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what it's gonna take for every single one of us to close the gap. And I think that goes for everyone on the panel, that goes for everyone in the room, that's everybody in the organization. It's gonna take 20% of our time to retool. That's a powerful message. Yeah, I think um, it's a mic drop moment. Um, but yeah, having that not driven by, by fear, but driven by opportunity and excitement, it's going to really lead. Uh, let's move on to Jeff at Marriott. So thinking about your guest experience, how does generative AI help your associates move from transactions to interactions? Yeah. One of our core premises is that we believe that the hospitality industry as a whole can be completely transformed by this. And it's really about saying, can we take those tasks that take a lot of time for humans to do and let them use that time now to engage with the guest and make moments that matter? 
if we think about specific places to do that, there are all sorts of opportunities in hotel operations. Imagine the hundreds of thousands of people who have to deliver that. And there are ways for us to take things like room readiness or room blocking or um, upgrades and make that much simpler so the associate can now spend time interacting with the guest. If you think about how it affects you post-stay, there are some times when you've, you've had this great stay, but you, there are some things you need to sort out. You need to call in and get some help for that. Today, the way that works is we have a huge knowledge base that an associate has to go through and listen to your question, search through it, and find the exact policy that applies. And that can be complex and time consuming. Uh, and it can require some translation as well. This is a case where now we can use these tools to make that much simpler, to figure out exactly what the root of the problem is, deliver the guests the answer really quickly and easily. And another is um, itinerary planning. This, this notion of trip planning, that our ambassadors, say, our, our guests who stay with us most frequently, our ability to help them find where they want to go, plan that out, and, and get there easily is, has just become magnified in a way that allows now every associate to have a much deeper understanding of the, the locations that they're sending these guests to than they would be able to in the past. So for us, this touches every bit of our guest journey, which is kind of our core fundament. Yeah, so enabling your, your associate in the day-to-day. -day. Right. Yeah. Take, the, take the time consuming menial labor stuff away from them. Let computers do what computers are good at. Let humans do what they're best at. That's uh, help our guests make great moments. Great, great point. So Joff at BMW, how are you helping your salespeople and customer service representatives embrace this new way of working with generative AI? Um, how has it improved experiences with your customers? Sure. Um, I, think, I think the first point is to elaborate what John said is when we talk about Gen AI, we look at the technology, we look at the use cases, but, but the way I try to share this with my board is to talk about this is a leadership challenge, and, and the leadership challenge is looking at the type of work our associates and our, and our teams will be doing in the future. So AI changes the way work is done, but the capabilities that we need across our organization throughout our business is rapidly changing. Uh, we can see that, we've seen that through 2023 and we're going to continue that in 24, where we're seeing that the roles that people are performing now um, are no longer needed or cannot be as efficient as some of the algorithms that we've, we've put in place. But what we need to do is to refocus them and, and make sure they can see the value up. So when we move towards the sales, the sales people in our, in our dealerships, they have an enormous amount of data um, when the customer comes into the dealership. If they have a, an appointment, there's so much data with regards to the BMW cars and the products, also on the individuals, and the sales people are so overwhelmed on how they can interact in a, in a more succinct way with their customers. The customers also know a lot more about the vehicles and the product than sometimes the sales people. So this, is, this has been a big challenge in how can they prepare for that meeting when they want to to ensure that the customer, um, the customer experience is, is a premium one. Um, what we've done is we've, we've created um, something called um, 10x sales, where we drive um, all of the data and populate that down to the salesman in a very small summarized version where their customer comes in. They know everything about their customer. They know their preferences. They know the product types. They know the test drives they've had the type of vehicles, but more importantly, they know a lot about the customer with regards to um, how they live their lives and the things they're involved in. So it could be that there's a DJ, and the, the summary will actually produce a very clear, concise way of, of communicating with, with that customer. If it's a DJ, it has certain um, language which the DJ can actually um, can resound with um, towards our products, and the same from an opera singer. So the personalization that we can now provide to our salespeople through AI is grown tremendously, where they can have a, a more comprehensive conversation around exactly what the customer wants, what they're looking at, where they can steer them if it's warranty, sales, or um, insurance. And this is what we're seeing is, is that the, the, the customer is trusting the salesperson a lot more because they're they're actually having the conversation on real data. They're not just making it up on the fly. They're, they're talking to them about where they came into the dealerships, how they can help them, proactively seeing where their insurance has changed, et cetera. So what that, what that, what's that's done from a salesperson's perspective is really enhance their role 
in not having to be concerned about all of the different data that, that the customer has on them and vice versa. And it's, it, it becomes a real life conversation, which from our customer's perspective, that they're really appreciating. Great, great points all around. Accenture, our research finds that 40% of hours worked will be impacted by generative AI, either automated or augmented. And you give, give such strong examples. So being able to help people do their jobs better, to be able to automate the mundane things you don't want to do anyways, and then to really lead not through fear, but through excitement. I think those are really critical points. So if we move on to our next imperative, number four, keep track. It's around closing the gap with responsible AI. So just anybody starting a generative AI project, there's two questions that they ask to get started. One is value and one is risk, right? Am I, am I gonna be not just fair and unbiased, but am I gonna be secure and safe and, and legal, right? Um, is my, are my consumers gonna be okay with what I'm doing? So let's have Asmita, you, you could kick this off. How is L'Oreal introducing responsible AI when using generative AI in marketing? Sure. Well, let me give context on beauty. Start with beauty there. Because beauty is uh, an essential human need. You know, it is about self-identity. It is about self-expression. Beauty makes people feel good about themselves. It gives them confidence. And beyond being an individual need, beauty is also deeply social, you know? because we can show uh, our affiliations where we belong with the beauty norms, or we can disrupt them and show other affiliations. So we know that, uh, that uh, when, when we face you know, the mirror of society, beauty can be an ambivalent force, both alienating and liberating. And it is only by understanding the, the dark side and the light side of technology and beauty can we construct a more human, more responsible, more uh, inclusive beauty tech? Yeah. And with that in mind, what one of the decisions we have taken is that we will not use any AI-generated hair or face, you know, in our uh, to enhance the product benefits in the external representation of beauty. Yes, we can use AI-generated hair and face uh, if we are doing it for inspiration, for idea generation, for storyboarding, yeah, or for internal communication. But because our consumers want to see the effect of our products on themselves, we will not use it for external representation of beauty. So that's one of the stance we have taken. And there is one more comment I'll make because I just spoke to you about beauty tech and the fact that we have been using AI for many years and we've built a lot of expertise and capabilities there. We have established trustworthy AI principles and written them down. You know, So it, there are seven trustworthy AI principles on which all our algorithmic work is done. And I'll take one or two examples uh, like a human, human oversight so that we don't have over-reliance on algorithmic decision-making, uh, like transparency and explainability. So we write it down that the consumer needs to know what we are doing and why we are doing and why they are seeing that effect. Representation. Uh, our skin diagnosis uses 15,000 images. Is it representing all skin types all over the world? Then there is data privacy, sustainability, and others. So we will, as corporates and people who are working with this, uh, we, we firmly believe that we will have to write them down. We will have to mandate ourselves that this is how we are going to be responsible. Uh, and I think uh, that, that, would, uh, that would make all the difference. I think that's so important to have it written down and then adopted as a company, right? It's not up to each individual or each project to make a call, but it, it, it is part of your core business code of ethics. Absolutely. We have written it down. It is part of our code of ethics. Uh, some of the principles are on our website, so, so, and we keep evolving them. Great. So, Oliver, uh, you, you work with a lot of uh, clients. How are you seeing um, others uh, think about responsible AI considerations applying with their consumers, but also with their employees and their partners? Yeah. I mean, I think a starting point here is that we're assuming that within the next two to three years, consumers in general, so people in this room, would have some sort of bot which is informing the sorts of consumption decisions they should make. 
And some of you are already using this to do things like trip planning, like where, if I'm trying to go to Iceland on holiday, what should I be doing? And it would all start to give you those sorts of guidance. That is going to become more and more sophisticated over time. And so the question of making sure that if you've got that sort of querying going on, it's going to steer consumers in very particular directions. And so having the right sort of data to inform that and to make sure that, it, that things are without bias and that they do have the right ethical standards and so on in place is something that's going to move very, very quickly. And the concern that we're seeing overall is of the five imperatives that you're going to talk through, this is probably the one where people are least developed, are least sophisticated, least understanding. And so emphasizing this, I think, is critical. So what we're finding as people are starting to do this is to look across the value chain, as the, team, as the, 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 audience, as the panelists are describing, and saying of the different ways in which um, a responsible AI should be applied, what are the risks, what's the relative importance of those risks through engaging with consumers, through engaging with customers, et cetera, and making sure that we take informed judgment about each of those risks and manage them, manage them appropriately. And so if you're sitting in the audience and you're not clear as you go through the process, what are those sorts of risks, that's probably a conversation just to make sure that you work through. Because as I said, of the five that Teresa's going to describe, this is the one that, where we see the biggest gaps being. And I think this is exactly what we need to mobilize right now while everybody's doing experimentation. You have to get this in place so that, um, you know, I'm sure that person at Samsung who used ChatGPT, I'm sure he or she was a hero for a week until uh, their code started appearing as part of the other responses. So really making sure that this is not just written, but that it is mobilized across that company. I just, there's one other thing here that we, we've put into the mix here, which is the point about uh, the environmental impact of the use of Gen AI. If you're not aware of this, it has a huge energy impact. And so one of the things we need to work through is, as you are applying it, what are those implications? And are, again, are you adopting that as one of your uh, trade-offs? So it's not just an ethical in terms of how we manage people. It's also ethical in terms of how do we actually manage the engagement with the planners as well. Thank you. So we're on the fifth imperative. And after this imperative, I'm going to open the uh, questions to the panelists to the floor so you can start thinking about that. We should have some time. Um, so the fifth one is around driving continuous reinvention. Right? We mentioned a year ago, none of us or, uh, were thinking that it would happen so fast. Maybe we knew about transformers, but um, I don't think any of us could have predicted how the speed and then the scale in which our leaders and our consumers were asking for us to do something with this technology. And so this need to have a continuous reinvention as a core corporate muscle that you could identify disruptions like generative AI, like changes in supply chain, like changes in talent, to be able to then do something about it and then to scale it out. So even though 50% of executives last year expected to make significant um, investments in generative AI, only 10% reported that they were seeing at scale value of, of, of AI, much less even generative AI. So that scale is really a key. Um, so how are companies going to manage this ongoing change without stressing the ongoing um, organization? So this one will start with, with Joff at BMW. So Joff, how is generative AI changing how your salespeople better serve your customers? Sure. Um, well, uh, in the last, it ties quite closely to the last question, um, and what we're doing there is we're really, it gives the sales people more time with the customer. Um, they have the data already there, they have a lot of the information on the customer already there. Um, so that's helping them um, have the time to look across the value chain. So they're normally just only looking at the sales, pro at one of element of the sales process, and now what they're doing is they're having the ability to look across after sales, warranty, and also insurance. They can look, look and proactively recommend to customers when their vehicle's coming out um, of, of their next, of next leasing into the next one where they can save money from that perspective. So I think that, that from a sales um, point of view, that's, that's really helping. I think from an from, from a IT perspective, with our ecosystem, we, are, we need to make sure there's a couple of things which are in place. I think the architecture needs to be scaled appropriately and we talk about we talk about use cases and, and, and speed and efficiency but I think from an architectural perspective the the ecosystem that we put on from a Gen AI point of view um, needs to be the right architecture it needs to be able to scale across a multitude of different areas so whilst we're doing that in the dealerships 
Um, across the whole enterprise, we're also doing that in our manufacturing locations where we're helping our, our shop floor um, associates uh, drive forward with, with the, the manuals they have as well. Then we move into our internal help desk. We move into the business where we can see gaps in the subject matter experts. So I think when we talk about um, moving that muscle across the organization, um, we haven't just focused on the sales area within the dealerships and the, and the, and the first example I gave around the service desk. We are looking across the whole enterprise to see how we can move that um, to bring maximum benefit and efficiencies. I think it goes back to John's point about speed, right? You got started and then you began doing these use cases that were getting uh, better in terms of time spent with the consumer, better personalization, and then you're building along the way more technology capability, more data capability. So really good way to reinvent. I, th I think the, the last point there is, is, is by, by bringing efficiencies into the, into, the, into the associate's time, they actually have some thinking time to work out actually how can they do their daily role in a different way. Yeah. Um, when you don't have that space and time to think, um, to ask, okay, what is your biggest challenge? They've got, they're overwhelmed with so much work. The ability to give them some time back to think, okay, how can you do this differently? If you could do this from a greenfield perspective, what would that look like? And I think that, that is really giving um, massive benefit, not just to, to, to us as, as leaders of organizations, but also to the associates, so they can, they can do more value-add work and think of different ways of driving forward with this technology. Thank you. So uh, next question is for Jeff. So part of intervention requires working across the company. How are you using uh, generative AI uh, to break down silos across Marriott so that you can work quickly? Yeah, it's, it's very much as we've heard repeatedly here. We've been using AI, of course, for a very long time, as everybody here has. But we knew we had to be faster in how we responded to this. We're generally very measured. Um, we're measure twice, cut once people for the most part. And so the way we looked at this is to say, let's approach both of those simultaneously. On the one hand, we need to move very quickly. And so there was a lot of work around uh, setting up fast teams, uh, setting up internal code fast to get hundreds of people to generate new ideas, to look at this space and see where the opportunities lie. Some of the things that came out of that have turned into projects that grew into our incubator. And in many of the, those cases, the first moves were human in the loop to make sure that we were very responsible about how we were doing them and still push things out to market. Simultaneously, we were working on our sort of slow to go fast path, uh, making sure that we had everything in order from uh, the perspective of security, of safety, of uh, responsibility. All of those things, uh, we are fortunate that we've been working on making sure that our data was set for years and years, so we're in a very good place data-wise, but it's really making sure that we had the organization geared around this. So we're now in a position where this year we're focused on launching, as I think many of us will be. Thank you. So Asmita, uh, with so much content enabled by generative AI, consumer care and e-commerce are being impacted. So how does L'Oreal introduce this reinvention in the beauty experience uh, with your customers? Well, we are, uh, we are continuously reinventing beauty experiences in the physical, digital, and virtual world. And uh, to give you the context, we embarked on the digital revolution uh, back in 2010, and we started digitalizing the beauty consumer journeys. We introduced beauty tech in 2018 because we wanted to seize the opportunities of emerging technologies. Now we are at this new frontier of technology, generative AI, and I'm very excited because like never before, creativity and technology are coming together like never before here. So what we are doing on this particular thing on content, et cetera, of course we, we have a generative AI test task force, but that is across human resources, RNI, technology, digital, and marketing. You know, and that is making sure that we are creating a safe experimentation space. We have a L'Oreal GPT that we are building. On marketing, uh, we, we are exploring various augmented marketing use cases, you know, which is content and creativity, and I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, services I just shared with you, consumer care, and you speak a lot about sales, and it's a bit the connected topic uh, on how to, how to leverage consumer care. Search. A fantastic new search experience is taking shape. Platform AI, where embedded AI in platforms will become more generative. So how to work on platform AI evolution that is happening. And we're working across all these points. If I pivot to creativity, 
I would say that we are in a very controlled experimentation period at the moment. So we have opened a generative AI lab, yeah? And that, uh, that purpose of that lab is because we believe that there could be Crea tech period coming in. We believe that technology will enhance creativity and spark creativity among 3D artists, makeup artists, copywriters, and you know, everything that we have been hearing about. What are we doing so far? We are creating visual codes of beauty. So we are creating some new visual codes of beauty. And here you see some of them coming one after the other, you know, in terms of saying, how can we envision beauty? And maybe you can show the third one here. Uh, then, uh, and beyond the visual codes of beauty, we are also looking at storyboarding. And storyboarding is becoming much faster with marketeers and agencies working closer together. We are looking at uh, e-commerce PDPs. You mentioned e-commerce PDPs too. Very, very good efficiency case. We are also working on social uh, campaigns and social media campaign to see how you can reinterpret a certain creative and content production. So behind you, you see Mugler, one of our fragrance and uh, fashion brands. And the question here is, uh, you want to challenge the viewer's perception on fragrances. Thank you. And say, okay, is there another way to look at it? Uh, uh, and this is the other way that can start coming in oh, there. Right. So with all of this, we are learning a lot. You know, we are learning a lot because uh, we want to see if this can become the marketeer's repertoire of tools tomorrow. We, want, we are asking questions on copyrights, uh, IP rights, confidentiality, and all of that. And like I mentioned before, we have taken a position that uh, we are not going to use AI-generated face or hair uh, for external representation of beauty. So I have to have the creative studios that enable folks to experiment yes. and then just you had so many use cases and it's amazing that you were able to enable folks to do that. John, how is Mondelez preparing for this perpetual change? I mean, I kind of look at it three parts. I think one is do the natural just inertia of our marketers and their natural curiosity, they are going out and doing this work. Mm. There is not a given week where we don't have a review board where we're looking at 30 different campaigns from examples of every single market from India to Philippines to Brazil with unique ideas about how they're gonna do it. And I think they're empowered by that, by our creative agency partners on what they're gonna do. So that's kind of part one. I think part two is you have to put the tools in their hands and that's where we use platform tools like consumer demand gen and others. And then the third thing is, you have to build a scaled infrastructure that you own to really go to the, to the next piece because I think you're gonna have to own that. Mm. And there's not been a time where we've really had to say, shoot, we're gonna have to really build a major infrastructure and technology and we have to own that. In the past, we've been able to rent or buy or partially use. I mean, a few clients built their own home cooked ad servers, but it was rare versus this. This is gonna be one of those unique inflection moments. And I think, you know, every year, you know, investor relation, Cagney's right around the corner and so, Everyone's gonna go on stage and be like, I have this many consumer data sets, I have this much first party data, I reach this much part. I think in the future, the conversation is gonna be about large language models and what are you doing and how early did you get in and how are you compounding that? How are you orchestrating that to come together? And so I, I describe it as there's a, we had a board presentation with Tiffany Soze who's here. We were in there talking to the, our MLT leadership and I said, look, after this slide, we're going to talk about Gen AI, and I, I want, if you have any questions about any of this, I need you to ask it now, because once we turn the page, we're going into another era of marketing, and I cannot go back. So if you have a question about this, we need to talk, cover it now, because we don't have time, and I can't go back here, because I won't be able to reinterpret it through where I am in the future. So we either get on that page collectively, or we can't go forward. And so let's just align now. And I, I think those are the powerful conversations you have, and it just gets people excited. I, I feel, I've been at Mondelez for six years, I've, I've long tenured, I've worked with the company 10 of the last 11, and I can tell you somewhere around the year, like I felt I knew what we were doing, and it, yes, we were continually improving, it's 1%, and there's some challenges that always come up, but I feel like I got a new lease on life. And I just say, you know, and my boss talked about today, he's like, you know, can happen, you had an exciting moment where you realized there was a gunshot to this race. I was with you guys in, in Accenture and I literally had Corbin and Vanky push a whiteboard down a yacht ramp to be like, I need a whiteboard, we've got to figure, and you, you get excited about this. Yeah. And I think every single market, is, when you go into a new era of new things and you don't know, you get excited about it or you really need to do something else or you need a new context. 
And I think that everyone can be excited because the future of marketing could be made at any single company. I don't think anyone's won this race. I don't think anyone's ahead in this race. In fact, if you won the last era, you're probably behind in this next era because you're gonna have to change the most. But everyone has a chance to win. And so where's the future gonna be made? Because it could be made here. Such a strong point, you just have to get started. Otherwise, you, you, you're not trying and failing or trying and succeeding, so, so great points. Oliver, help us close it out. So are these examples consistent with what you're seeing with, um, across the industry? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the, obviously these are great examples of innovation that we're seeing I mean, and from, some of the leading, from some of the leading players. I think when we've been having these conversations across the industry, more and more of the time in rooms has been focused on the people dimension. I think people recognize the disruption from the technology side, but the ability to help human beings through this journey is going to be a huge, huge differentiator for, for folks. And, and I, I just call that out in a, in a couple of ways. One is, when we've been doing sessions, one of the things that has, has taken up a surprising amount of time is the comfort level with leadership in operating in the era that we are now in. Because the skills, the leadership capabilities that are going to be required over the next five to 10 years are different from those that have been vital over the last 10 to 20. And so a lot of executives are saying to us that they think that as many as half of their current leaders are probably ill-suited to the world that we're now in. And so we are seeing a strong focus on leadership upskilling, leadership awareness, and so on, to support them in this sort of journey. The page turning that John's describing, that, that sort of thing to get people comfortable, because if they're not comfortable with turning the page, then the whole programs that you're seeing are going to get disrupted. So I think one, for one question for me is, as you're thinking about this uh, in the audience, is the degree to which you think that the folks that are going to make decisions as to the pace of progress and the degree to which you change the organization, whether there's real comfort level in that. I think the second thing I'd call out is that, by and large, um, workers across the, the companies that we work with want to engage in this change. Right? They see this as a positive thing. They think that they want to understand where the technology is going. They don't want this done to them. They want to do it with, with us and develop it. And we genuinely believe that this is going to lead people to be net better off. Because as everybody's described, there's a consistent thing here, which is that the work that is going away is by and large work that people want to do less. They want to spend less time on. They want to spend more time interacting with customers, not preparing to meet with customers. They want to spend more time on innovation, not putting together core material on which they can then innovate. And, and Gen AI and, the, and all the process improvements that go with that offer that potential to work in that, in that sort of way. And, and we do honestly believe in the era where there's been a lot of conversation in the media about, oh, jobs are going away, et cetera, of all the executives that we talk to, one of the most consistent trends that's emerging is that this will not just leave people net better off in terms of the work that's currently being done, but it's also going to create new roles which are more rewarding than those that are going away. So the support of people through this journey and being very planful around that is something that we're seeing us spending more and more and more time on, but it offers an incredibly exciting future for the industry as a whole. Great, and that's why it's our last imperative, right? You need to be able to have that top-down leadership support to allow you to reinvent with the right tools and the responsible AI mechanism. But at the end of the day, it's enabling the people to dream and to, to try and, and to uh, experiment on their own. So, so with that, let's open it to the audience. Um, I think we should have a, we have a, a microphone. If you have any questions, um, please raise your hand and then share your title and organization and, um, and name. Any questions? I guess you guys should be on the panel then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's a, yeah. I have a question if not, but. Hi, I'm Rita, and I work at L'Oreal, and um, I am a user experience professional. Um, so when you talk about the upskilling and human in the loop and, the, and really the qualifications and skills that you need, what specifically are you talking about? 
like what kinds of skills and what kinds of um, maybe backgrounds and educations will be applicable and needed for these generative and predictive AI tools. Who wants? Jump it. Go. You got this. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, like anything else, I think this is about problem solving. It's about saying that this opportunity, John brought up, this is, um, in some ways, this is almost like performance enhancing drugs for creatives. This isn't going to make creativity go away. This is going to uh, take it to another level. So you have to learn how to use these new tools. So that's really about saying, uh, just like you'd have to learn how to work with a new brush or any other new medium, it's, it's figuring out how to get what you need out of this medium. So as a creative, I think that's the core, is to say, it's now figuring out how to use this set of tools to get the result you want, because it's radically different than what we've had in the past. Uh, I think for most people, that there's an almost natural shift in this when we talk about our associates in, in dealing with uh, our guests. The fact of the matter is, nobody got into hospitality for the love of vacuuming floors or cleaning toilets or the love of looking at a computer for five minutes while they're trying to look things up. So it's really just getting back to what they're great at in interacting with people. So I think that that skill of being able to work with other humans is a, a valuable thing and will become more so again. And if, go ahead. No, she, no, she I, works for you. You should answer yeah, yeah. She wants to know what she needs to do to get promoted next year. What she got to do, Esme, yeah. come on. Well, I, think, I think one thing that, that I feel very excited about as marketeer, you know, is creativity and technology that's coming together like never before. So this use of left brain and right brain and the meeting place of left brain and right brain. Uh, it is going to happen, and I think as marketeers, it's a huge opportunity for us that you're going to use both of them to spark something new. Uh, and, and how to use both of them, because sometimes we, we tend to put people into, oh, he's very creative and she's very analytical, but here you have to use both of them together. Uh, and that's a huge opportunity for people. Uh, I think some thoughts on what you got to do. So first of all, like as we've cost out what we're going to spend in Gen I, we have to spend $2 on people and change management for every $1 in tech and data. Two to one. And when I started this, I didn't expect it to be that way. I, usually, every time you do a big program, you spend all this money on a big toy, and then you're like, oh, by the way, here's an extra, you know, for like on the side. But this is a two to one the other way. And I think that's the first time we're really gonna commit to a big shift that way. And I think you have to think about it, you have to cost it out that way, and if you're not thinking two to one, redo your math. In terms of the skills, I think the first thing you have to do is you have to PMO the hell out of this thing. Because you're gonna to have to go through your entire process and see where you're gonna suck the efficiency out of this thing. How are we gonna redo how we concept, how we test assets, how we ultimately build storyboards, how we produce assets? Like, I think there's just gonna be a massive rehaul of that. I also think the big thing that we're not talking about is the distinctiveness of your brands will matter better. In a lot world, in a world where everyone can produce world-class assets, I mean Super Bowl quality production, everyone will be there. That is going to raise the bar, mm -hmm. but everyone will be in that moment. And so, what will hold you different is your distinctiveness. And I and I like how distinct is your brand? Because any lack of clarity in that will only be distorted and scaled by AI. So if you are fuzzy on that it will be worse because I think the biggest moment will be is when you sit down to really train and refine and tune those models on your brand. That will be the moment of clarity. And I went through that as we were building Milka's brand brain. We ultimately were trying to get Halloween assets. It wasn't clear. Then we had to go to Christmas. We literally, all those playbooks that I've always used to level my coffee table because that's all they're good for. I, we fed them in and magically it understood what Christmas was. And I'm like, holy shoot, there's a use for playbooks. I've never, you know, I just, I thought we just made those, you know, to look nice on my bookshelf. But I, I think there's a need for that distinctiveness. And so that is where you'll win. Are you really clear? Are you sharp? Yeah. And can you sit down and really trick? Because that is a skill. And so I think there will be a rejuvenation of a combination between great account planning and brand strategy and great technologists. And those people together will create the future of what Gen AI is in marketing. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions right here in the front? Hi. I'm an SME entrepreneur from Europe. And uh, recently, 
Peter Diamandis from uh, the Singularity University stated that soon enough there will be two kind of companies. One will be those who adopt generative AI and the others will be those who are bankrupt. <laughs> so I want to ask the panelists, how do you agree with this statement and how do you see smaller companies like uh, a medium to, to small companies to follow the trail of larger companies in this respect? I can, I can start, and you know, it's a very profound question, but I think uh, if you, everybody has a mobile phone in their pocket. Yeah, and if 20 years ago we were asked that are there companies who will adopt digital or not adopt digital, uh, it was a question then. And at some point it normalizes so much that it's no more a question. If the technology is the right one, and if the use cases are the right one, what will happen? It, it will normalize to a point where you don't realize what you're getting is a recommendation engine or this or not, but it has to be the right use cases that allow us to get to that normalization point. Um, just, um, I think, just to add, a, add another perspective, I think you're making the assumption that the medium companies are the ones that are gonna be bankrupt, not the larger companies. That, and I think, I think uh, what you've heard today is around speed and efficiency. Um, some, of the, some of the bigger companies um, and their appetite for risk um, is a lot different to a medium company who actually will start to, start to drive some of those digital assets at that company rather than the larger ones. So I think, um, as John said, it's a game, game changer. Um, who, is, who is starting the race now? Um, and also the, the appetite for success as well as risk. And so what I'm seeing also in, in larger corporate companies, that appetite to start now, um, there's an experimental phase, but also the risk um, is also an important and imperative part of that. Also the processes, and it comes back to the, the previous question, some, what you find in organizations is that we're putting in processes over a period of time as a gatekeeper to double check the previous process. And what needs to happen is the leadership team in, in those organizations need to to take a leap of faith into technology to remove that process. And what you'll see is a lot of process harmonization, but also, and that is huge in a large organization and some of the medium ones that you're suggesting and, and alluding to can actually start to, to drive a lot further forward than the larger ones. So I think it's a different perspective as well on that, on that side of things. Uh, I, yes, oh, ahead. Look ahead. I think it won't be the differentiation between, I agree with you, it's not big or small, but there will be a differentiation between fast and slow because I rack my brain to figure out how I will catch someone who is ahead because of the compounding and what I believe not to be linear but exponential mm. delta of someone who gets ahead of you. Because I have just seen the, just the quantum, the order of magnitude impact and again the exponential piece. I mean, a look inside the twisted mind of me is before I go to bed four nights a week, I watch that Wired video of the machine learning how to play Pong and break, Brick Breaker. And it reminds me to run like hell because I see how good the machine gets after 10 or 100 or the, and just every single one produces it that much faster. And I do not want to be the person behind the competition on that because I do not know how to catch them. And in everything else, I've known how I would catch them. I know how I counter the move of digital. I know how I countered when people went to mobile first. I knew how when people got that first. But in this one, I have not figured it out. And there are some short-term things. If someone has a little bit more first-party data than someone else, okay, maybe a little bit. But it's quickly outdone by time. And so make no confusion. This is a race. And you are either running or you're not. And I choose to run like hell. Yeah. I'll just make one build on to your, to your points. I think the industry as a whole, I think people are assuming that they're going to get engaged with Gen AI as a whole. There is a question about the speed with which people are playing, but I'm not hearing very many companies saying, oh, we're not going to go, we're not going to go into that space. There is a different level of risk tolerance. I'm seeing that quite markedly across different executive teams that we're talking to. There are some who are very, very cautious about this and they want to see others move further forward and so on. And I think those folks will struggle. And what we are seeing when we're looking at this is that those that are early adopters are accelerating away. So the point that, that John and some of the others have made around that I think is absolutely vital. 
But the other point I would make is that when we're thinking about this, this is about the reinvention of processes with Gen AI, but with other technologies and changes in people and so on. So don't think just, if you're in the audience thinking, oh, this is just about use cases. You've heard everybody talking about, this is about processes, and it is thinking about Gen AI in combination with other technologies, with changes in ways of working, et cetera, that will bring this, bring this to be. And that's really where this becomes this really combinatorially powerful technology, which is going to be disruptive. And as, Tra as Tracy said in her intro, this is impacting over half of all of the working hours in the industry, right? That doesn't mean those hours go away completely, but it means there's an opportunity to make them better, more creative, more rewarding. And that is a bigger level of disruption than we've ever seen. Last point? Or... I think I'm going to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, we're out of time, but it was a really great discussion. Thank you for everybody. And um, hopefully, you learned the five must do imperatives. And you need to get started. And you're probably already behind, right, if you're not there. So thank you, everybody. Bravo. Thank you so much. <laughs>